All right, brethren. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's read our text again. Verses 11 and 12. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our subject is the good pleasure of God's goodness. The good pleasure of God's goodness. The way that God is going to count his saints worthy. The way he will count you worthy of this calling is by God fulfilling all the good pleasure of his goodness in you in power. It will all be by grace. It will be by God our Father and the Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit. It will be by grace. By God fulfilling the good pleasure of his goodness in you. Now there is none good but God. That's what the scriptures tell us. There's none good but God. God is goodness. He is goodness. The good pleasure of goodness is the good pleasure of God. God is goodness. You see there the his is in italics, it's added by the translators, it's a little redundant really, because the good pleasure of goodness has to be the good pleasure of God, because he's the only one good. <laughs> it's the good pleasure of God. God is good of himself and independent of himself. The only one that's good, there's nothing in God but goodness, and there's nothing that comes from God but goodness. No iniquities in his nature, no unrighteousness is in his ways, no sin is in any of his works. All that comes from God is good. All the things God declared of himself to Moses is God's goodness. Let's go over there and look at Exodus 33. This is, this is God's goodness. It's not just these other things and then God's goodness. These things make up God's goodness. Exodus 33 and really that's so of all God's attributes. They're all so vitally united that, they're, you know, we have to look at things separately. But God is good, and all these things make up his goodness. In Exodus, Exodus 33, 19, Exodus 33, 19, he said, I'll make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will pro proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he put him in the cleft of the rock. That's where we see God's goodness is in Christ the rock. That's the picture there. Now look down at Exodus 34 and look at verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. Now this is the Lord's goodness. All this makes up his goodness. He proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Most men speak of their own goodness. That's what the scripture says. Scripture says in Proverbs 20, verse 6, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Well, Christ is that faithful man, and he's God. And when the rich young ruler came to our Lord Jesus, he came speaking of his own goodness, what he had done. And because he thought the Lord was just a man like any other man, he called him good. And Christ is God, and he's the faithful man. And he said to him, there's none good but God. Why do you call me good? He corrected him. He, and if, if he's going to call him good, he needs to acknowledge he is the God in human flesh. That's so. There's none good but God. None good but God. Whatever goodness is in God's creation, it came from God. The goodness of, that's in his elect angels is of God. The goodness that was in Adam before the fall when he was innocent and upright, God created that. The goodness of 
of his saints is of God by his grace. Every good gift, every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God says this of sinful man. This is what he says of you and me and our flesh. Your goodness is as a morning cloud. And as the early do, it goeth away. We may do something good if God works it, but it's like the do. It's here and then it's gone. But God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Working only goodness, working only the good pleasure of His goodness toward His people. So we're going to see here tonight what the Scripture says about the goodness of the good pleasure of God's goodness. The good pleasure. I just like the sound of that. The good pleasure of God's goodness. First of all, here's what I want to show you. The goodness of God is particular toward his elect Israel. It's particular toward his elect Israel. It's the goodness of God to create in us a clean heart and make us know his goodness. Paul is writing here to God's elect, and this is what Psalm 73, 1 says. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. That's his elect Israel. God's good to his elect Israel. Now God's goodness is upon all his creation. His goodness is upon all his creation. It's upon those that love him and upon those that don't love him, that hate him. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Everybody benefits from the goodness of the Lord, even men that hate him and despise him. The Lord's good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. He gives the sun and the rain on the just and the unjust. You go home tonight and read Psalm 104. He declares God's goodness in providing and preserving all his creation. Everything he created, he provides life, he provides food, he provides everything that's needed and preserves his creation. That includes man and beasts and trees and, and fish of the sea. Everything's included in that psalm. It says, He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth. God's goodness does that. But to try you in God's saving goodness, his saving goodness is only to his elect. It is only to his elect. Truly God is good to Israel. We know this from Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 says, God the Father chose whom he would in Christ before the foundation of the world. He blessed us with all spiritual blessings in, by choosing us in Christ, and he predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. And here's the reason. According to the good pleasure of his will. And then the Son of God came and took flesh. Who did he say he is? He said, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd laid down his life for who? For the sheep. That's who he laid down his life for. And Ephesians 1 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, according to the, the good pleasure of his goodness. And then he sent the gospel, and the Spirit of God created a clean heart in us and gave us faith, and gave us an understanding to know the things God's freely given to us. And it says in Ephesians 1.9, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Himself. This is the good pleasure of His goodness. When Psalm 73.1 says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart, He didn't behold a clean heart in us. And therefore, he's good to us. That's not what it means. Because he's good to his people, he chose us, and Christ redeemed us, and therefore he came and created a clean heart in us. And he keeps purging us and keeps a clean heart in us. It's his goodness to us that keeps a clean heart in us. The Lord is good to Israel. The only reason we repented 
from ourselves and owned ourselves to sinner and owned that we could do nothing to make ourselves righteous or holy. And the only reason we keep repenting and, and live a life of repentance, turning, being turned and continually turning to the Lord, the only reason is the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God. That's what Romans 2, 4 says. It's the riches of His goodness, the riches of His goodness and forbearance and long-suffering. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And it wasn't just before you believed that he was forbearing and long-suffering and good to work repentance in you. It's after we believe him too. If he marked iniquity, we couldn't stand before him. It's only in the righteousness of Christ that he continues to be forbearing to us in what we are and long-suffering and, and by his goodness, he keeps turning us to the Lord. Is there anybody here... I pray one of these days I'm going to be preaching and I'm just going to see a face light up for the first time as somebody's hearing this gospel and hearing it. And if you are, let me tell you what. God's mercy and His free forgiveness is in Christ. And if you need mercy and you need free forgiveness, you cast your care on Him. You come to Him. You come to Him. If God's created a clean heart in us, that's what we'll do. That's the only time we start hearing this. That's the only time we're honest to say, I am the sinner. Well, God's good, and if he's worked that in you, and you come to him asking mercy and grace, he'll show you mercy and grace and forgiveness. Psalm 86, 5 says, Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon him. Psalm 107, 8 says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. For He satisfies the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. There's an important word there when He says He fills the, the longing soul with goodness. This works spiritual. It's inwardly. It's in the new heart. It's in the soul. We're not talking about him just, he'll provide some good things in his life, but that's not the blessing. The blessing is knowing him. The blessing is being filled with his goodness spiritually. That's what he do. And if he's giving you a longing for him, you call on him. He's, he's ready to forgive them that call on him. So first of all, the only reason we believe him in the first place and entered this calling it's because of His goodness. That's it. The only way we stay in it is His goodness. Now secondly, it's the goodness of God working in us in power by His grace that makes His saints worthy of this calling. Now He's called you. It was by the goodness, the good pleasure of His goodness. He called you. But it's only by that same good pleasure of His goodness that's going to make us worthy of this calling. There's no worthiness in us by nature. It's all going to be of God. It's all going to be His work that makes us worthy of this calling. That's why Paul prayed to God for his brethren. He didn't tell them, now you do something to make yourself worthy of this calling. He said, wherefore also we pray always for you that God would, that God would, that God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus might be glorified in you. You might praise Him and then one day be glorified in Him according to the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I wish we really could enter into the fact there is no goodness in man. These things we see that we complain about all around, that's of man, that's of the devil, that's of man, sinful, fallen man, the evil, the wickedness. And even when it appears good, there's generally an evil, wicked motive of selfish gain behind it. There is none good but God. So if he's going to work in us and make us worthy of this calling, it's going to be by the goodness of God. Only by the goodness of God that we continue under the sound of the gospel. That's what the scriptures tell us. God's made us satisfied with Christ alone to hear Christ preached in his house and Christ honored and glorified. He had to make us satisfied with Christ. That's how he planted us in his house. 
You're familiar with Psalm 65, 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causes to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. What makes people come in, come in and hear the gospel preached and just pass on through? And then some come and hear the gospel and they're planning because God made them satisfied with the goodness of his house. Who's the goodness of his house? Christ is. Christ is the goodness of his house. He blesses us to know he chose us. We didn't choose him. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest. That makes God's people satisfied. He chose me. He won't cast me away. God blesses us to know he caused us to approach unto God. This is why men aren't satisfied with God's house. They come in and they want to say, I made myself approach to God. No, no, no. Those that are planted in God's house and satisfied with the goodness of God's house know God made me approach unto Him. And God blesses us, planting us in the house of the Lord so that we dwell in God's courts. He's made us satisfied with the Lord Jesus Christ who is, the, who is, the, who is goodness personified. We're going to dwell in God's house because He's made us satisfied with Christ. He's made us satisfied with the goodness of His house. We're satisfied that Christ is all. This is, the world's not satisfied with this. They'll tell you they're not satisfied with it. Now, you just can't preach Christ as all and just preach Christ. You're going to have to add something in there that man's going to have to do. God makes His child satisfied. Christ is all. If you get a chance to listen to the message I preached on there Saturday, I preached on Christ as salvation. I preached from 1 Corinthians 1.30 how he's wisdom, he's righteousness, he's made unto a sanctification and redemption. That's salvation. When you know Christ is all four of those things, you have everything. You have all, and you know it's all Christ. And that's how God makes you satisfied with His house. So we're satisfied to hear the message that gives Christ all the glory. This is how He keeps us planted. This is the goodness of His house. The goodness of His house is our good God who saves us according to His goodness, the good pleasure of His goodness. And He keeps you satisfied to hear that gospel giving our triune God all the glory. He makes you satisfied with the preacher He provides for you. He said, he said, I will provide pastors which shall feed you with not, after my own heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. That God's people really and truly look at it like this. If we have a power, when I had a pastor that I sat under, I had one in Arkansas, then I had one in Tennessee, and I have one now. I just don't sit under him. But I, I call him a lot and get counsel from him, and I listen to his preaching. We review that as really and truly, that's somebody God gave to me to feed me, and it's Christ feeding me through that man he gave me. We don't look at it like I put that man in place, and I, I, that man's going to do what I tell him to do, and, and he better be glad I'm supporting him, and better be glad I'm doing this. Let me tell you something, as a preacher of God, I love you, and I'm thankful that that you do give of yourself and sacrifice and all. But this work is Christ's work. And Christ is sustaining me and nobody else. And he, he, that's what God's people rejoice in. We're satisfied with that. We're satisfied with it. We're satisfied with our brethren. But you know why are you satisfied with your brethren? Christ dwells in your brethren, just like he dwells in you. And your brethren are the closest thing you're going to get to Christ on this earth in, in, a, in a body. And he, he makes you know that. And he makes you know you need them and they need you. They know they need you. And you're so satisfied with Christ and you're so satisfied with his gospel that you're willing to look over whatever you got to. Like Christ commanded us to do, you're willing to cover the sin of your brethren. Because that's what he commanded. Because that's what he did for us. And remind them of the gospel and keep them looking to Christ above. You know, God's house must go through much trouble. That, that's, his house is His people, and we have to go through much people. Uh, you'll be satisfied with the goodness of His house. His house consists of God, in whom we are, 
we abide as a tabernacle, a temple. His house consists of Christ our head, who's the head. He's the tabernacle, true tabernacle. His house consists of, of the, his preacher and his people in whom he dwells, who dwell in him. This is a living house. You, as lively stones are built up, a holy temple unto God. This is, this is a house made of God and his people. And, but we're going to have to go through trouble. The Lord said we would have to go tr through trouble. Christ put us in, the, in, he left us in the body of sin. He left us in a sin-cursed world. And he united us together in his body with sinners saved by grace. And he did all that according to the good, the goodness, the good pleasure of his goodness. That's why he did all that. Because he's going to use all that to teach us more of him. But here's what he said he'll do. Those, those of you that believe him, Christ made you priests unto God. His preacher and his people, he made us priests unto God by his blood. And here's what Jeremiah 31, 14, this is what God promised to do. I will satiate the soul of the priests with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. That's what the Lord keeps doing. It's Christ satiating our soul with fatness, filling the longing soul with fatness and making us satisfied. That's how we learn. That's, he's teaching us this. He's teaching us to submit to Christ in the face of all trouble. And it's through all this trouble that we have to go through that he satiates our soul more and more and grows us up in him and teaches us he's doing it all. I'll tell you a story. I just shared this with somebody not long ago. In the early 90s, I didn't understand why my pastor was doing a certain thing. Marvin was doing something a certain way, and I didn't understand why he was doing it. And I should have looked to Christ. I should have looked to Christ. I should have prayed to him. I should have prayed for Marvin. I should have waited and trusted the Lord and, and just trusted the Lord would teach me what he was doing. But I was young and dumb, and I didn't do that. I wrote to three faithful pastors asking them to help me. And without, they didn't correspond with each other, but they all three replied and wrote me a letter. And all three of them said the same thing. I'm paraphrasing what, what all three of them said. They, they, I mean, if you'd put them side by side, you'd have thought they got together and, and wrote these letters out in the same room. One lived, one lived out west of me, one lived north of me, one lived way east of me. They didn't even talk to each other. Here's what they wrote to me. Now, listen, listen to this. what I'm saying. God, Christ said, I'll satiate the soul of my priests, and they'll be satisfied with my house. He said, I will do this. Here's what they wrote to me. They said, do you believe Christ is the head of the church? Do you believe he fills all and all his people? Do you believe he's sovereign to work his will in his church? Then stop murmuring. Stop trying to correct your pastor. Submit to Christ and trust him to work by submitting to your pastor. Submit to your brethren, and if need be, Christ will correct your pastor's errors, your brethren's errors, your errors, and he will teach you all in the process. All three of them wrote that same thing to me. <laughs> and, and Christ satiated my soul with that word, and he gave me he, he satisfied me to just wait on the Lord and look to the Lord and pray to the Lord and trust the Lord to work in my pastor and in my brethren. And, I, and, and by his grace, I heeded that counsel and I found it to be so. What they said was so. The Lord works in his people, corrects his people, keeps his people, teaches us all in the process. You know, well, that's the last time you had to be taught that. No, no, no. Ten years later, I acted like I'd never even heard it. And I had to be reminded again. Another faithful pastor reminded me, you believe God's sovereign? Act like it. <laughs> Trust him. Trust him. See, the satisfaction is given to us by God, and it's the satisfaction of knowing Christ is the head of his church. He feels all in all. He's overruling the trouble. 
he keeps his preacher and his people. When he was in the back of that ship and he was asleep and that storm came, where do you think that storm came from? Who do you think sent that storm? The same one that was asleep on the pillow sent the storm. Who, who was the one who calmed the storm? Same one who sent the storm. <laughs> Why did he send it? To teach us everything we learn in that account, that we need to look to him and that he's the only one that can calm the sea. And the moment we look from him, we're going to sink down. When Christ makes us submit to him, that's when we're going to submit to one another. And you know what we're doing? We're not just saying, you know, it's not, Peter's not just saying, oh, just submit to one another and let each other run all over each other. He does say, you know, Scripture says take the fault. Suffer yourself to be defrauded. That's okay. What's, what's the big deal if, if that happens? But what he's saying is this. Cast all your care on Christ. Trust Christ. He's caring for you. He's caring for his people. And that's the only way we can resist the devil. Peter said it's by steadfastly looking to Christ. We can't resist him. And all the divisions that go on in churches and the troubles that come, you know what that is? That's the devil just having a play day. And all this stuff of trying to stand for the glory of God, and I'm going to fix this and all this. No, 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 no. That's just submitting to the devil. <laughs> That's not looking to Christ and trusting Christ. And then also it's knowing this. It's knowing Christ is working the same affliction in your brethren. He's accomplishing the same affliction in your brethren. We have a tendency to think nobody's suffering like I'm suffering. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Oh, poor pitiful me. No, Peter said that's just as much as the devil trying to get you. What did he say to Eve? Has God said, God's keeping something from you. God's not being fair to you. That's the devil's thoughts he puts in our head. Just know Christ is ruling in the heart of your brethren just like he's ruling in your heart and, and he's accomplishing this. And so we pray to Christ our head just like Paul's doing in our text. Paul's, Paul can't be with these brethren and he's praying, Lord, I pray that you, I pray you work all the good pleasure of your goodness in them. I pray you work this work of faith with power in them and make, count them worthy of this calling. Do it by your grace. Make them glorify Christ. You see, it's not us that's keeping things together. We didn't save ourselves. We didn't redeem ourselves. We didn't choose ourselves. We didn't quicken ourselves. It's not us that's preserving ourselves or keeping his church together. It's the goodness of God. He keeps his saints protected when enemies of the cross oppose us. Look over at Psalm 31, 19. Look at this, Psalm 31, 19. Oh, how great, Psalm 31, 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. See how that starts? Oh, how great is thy goodness. That's, it's the goodness of God working this. That pavilion's Christ. He's going to keep you hedged about. And when we, you and me, and we, we get puffed up in our flesh, and we just, these things we do to try to fix things, we're you just try to usurp Christ's throne. And, and we start beholding a splinter in our brother's eye. Well, with those two things, we got a beam in our eye. But it's God's goodness. It's His goodness. It's Him working the goodness, His good pleasure the good pleasure of his goodness. And he's going to show us mercy and forgiveness and save us from our own sins. We have a new man, but we also have a sin nature. Look over at, at, uh, look over at Psalm 25. We have a new man, but we also have a sin nature. Now, we don't glory in our new man. We don't look to our new man. We don't have confidence in our new man. Our confidence is Christ. But you know the Spirit of God does make a distinction between our sinful flesh and the new man God's created. Romans 7, Paul said, I know that in me, he said, hold on, that is in my flesh. In that part of me that's of Adam dwells no good thing. To will is present with me. Where's that? That's in the part God created, in the new man. But I can't perform that which I would because of my sinful flesh. 
See, all good's in our new man. The goodness of God created our new man. And Christ is the goodness of the new man. Born of incorruptible seed, Peter said the new man in you is uncorruptible. Created in the righteousness and true holiness of Christ. We can't produce fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there's no, no, no law. And it's our will of our new man to always walk in the Spirit. Paul said, but what I will, I can't always do. That's due to my sin nature. But when trouble comes, and, and it, when it comes is when we usually find out we still got a sin nature, <laughs> and we need to be forgiven. But by the Spirit of God's goodness working in us, our faithful Father chastens us, turns us back to Christ, and He's going to keep us crying out to Him from the new man. And here's what we cry. Look at Psalm 25, verse 7. This is what He's going to keep us crying out. Verse 7, remember not the sins of my youth. Not so sins back there. We get to looking back. Nor my transgressions right now. That's right now. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. All this is by the goodness of God. Remember me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it's great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. That's the goodness of our God. That's what Paul's praying for them. That's what he's praying for him, that God will fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. He's told the Philippians, it's God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You know why he told them that? In the context, he's telling them, Christ is right there. He's in your midst. He's in you, and he's in the midst of his church. And he's working in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. And the result of that, he said, so do everything without murmuring and disputing. <laughs> no need to murmur and dispute. Christ is working. And it's all going to be good. I will satiate the soul of the priest with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. So we pray to God, oh God, thou art good and do us good. Teach me thy statutes. That's, you know... We can do a lot of things where we're trying to impress men and, and it's really just us trying to appear like we're righteous and faithful and been in the faith a long time. And really by it, most of it, we just proven we proven we need to be taught again. But the Lord is good and He does good. And he'll bring you down to submit to him and say, Lord, you're good. None good but you. You do good, and I need you to teach me. That came from Psalm 119. That's that, if you're going to understand Psalm 119, you need to end, start with the ending. And it starts with David saying, Lord, I'm going to stray like a lost sheep. Save me. Recover me. And that whole psalm is David going through one trial after another and ended up right there at Christ's feet saying, Thou art good and you do good. Lord, teach me your statutes. After the affliction, that's the psalm where he said, Lord, it's been good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. What's his statute? They're real simple. Believe him, trust Christ, and love one another. Be merciful to one another. Be forgiven. Be long Do for one another everything He's doing for you and saving you. And trust Him while you do it. Trust Him for your own righteousness. Trust Him to work in your pastor and in, his, in your brethren and in His churches everywhere. Trust Him. And as you do so, just treat your brethren just like He treats you. Merciful, forbearing, long-suffering, lowly. So lastly, by continually working this good pleasure, it's back there in 2 Thessalonians now, chapter 1, by him working the good pleasure of his goodness in us, God's going to keep his saints full of joy. God's people are happy people. 
And this is how he keeps us full of joy. He's going to keep us full of joy. And here's, what, here's our rejoicing. We're going to give Christ all the glory. That's the purpose of all this, is to give our God and our Savior all the glory. Look at verse 12. Why is Paul praying the Lord will work this? Verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. God, God, when it says that the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, that's God making us glorify Christ by trusting him alone to work in his people, trusting him to work through this gospel, and then when he does, we just praise him. We glorify him. We give him all the glory. Listen to Jeremiah thirty-three eleven. You know, Christ fulfills every covenant work promise of God. And this is a covenant promise of God. Jeremiah 33, 11, The voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For our cause to return the captivity of the land is at the first, saith the Lord. The Lord said, that's what's going to be in my house. It's going to be the voice of Christ the bridegroom. It's going to be the voice of the bride. It's going to be, they're going to be filled with joy. They're going to praise the Lord of hosts. They're going to be saying, the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. They're going to bring sacrifices of praise into the house of the Lord. Why? Because He returned our captivity. Think about it. What do we praise Him for? He came and delivered us from the captivity of the curse of the law, making us righteous by His work. He delivered us from the captivity of the devil, the strong man that was stronger than us. He delivered us from the captivity of our sin nature, and He keeps doing it. And he's going to deliver us through, from the captivity of every trouble we face. And that's going to make you joy and glory only in the Lord and say, oh, the Lord's good. He worked it by his goodness and he's going to bring us to say the Lord is good. He's mer his mercy endures forever. He's going to keep us glorifying in him, glory in him. And it's all by the grace of God our Father and our Lord Jesus. And you know, I, I said he left us in this body of death. He's we got all these troubles in this world and all there are going to be troubles in the church. It's, it's so God, as he's fulfilling the good pleasure of his goodness in us and the work of faith and power, he's going to keep his saints speaking only of God's goodness. That's why he's doing it. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, the psalmist said. They'll sing of thy righteousness. You know, literally, what do we sing about <laughs> I, when I read that psalm, Psalm 145, 7, he said, they'll, they'll remember your great goodness and they'll sing of your righteousness. What do we sing about? We sing about God's goodness and God's righteousness. For any of God's saints who are captive, I don't care however, I don't, if you're here, you're captive in some way, if you're listening to this later or now somewhere else and you're captive, I want you to hear this. This is what the Lord said. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in Him. Trust Him. Trust in Him. The Lord's good, Nahum said. The Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows them that trust in Him. And because Christ is the good shepherd, this is what He tells us, brethren. He's the good shepherd. And Psalm 23 tells us, Surely goodness... And mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Think about this, brethren. We, we're gonna, if you're His, you're going to continue assembling with His people under the sound of the gospel all your days. And when you pass from this life, you know what you're going to do for eternity? You're going to dwell in the house of the Lord. <laughs> assembling, hearing Christ exalted and worshiping and singing praises to him. That's what we're looking forward to. He's, he's glorified in us right now. He brings us to praise his goodness right now. But one day he's coming to glorify us in him. And, and Job said, I had fainted. He said, I'd faint unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That land of the living is where Christ is with all his people in glory. And when we're in that day, we're going to see the goodness of the Lord in perfection. I, I, you know, I'm speaking out 
off the cuff here, but this is what I really believe. I do believe in that day we're going to understand better or fully everything Christ ever worked for us and see all the things that we thought was bad, how good they all was. Everything he ever worked for us was good. And no, like he says, we're going to know as we're known. We're going to know everything he's ever done for us. And we're going to see it's the goodness of the Lord. Everything he did for me was good. I had no reason. I'd murmur and complain about the least thing. Everything he did for me was good. That's so, brethren. I pray that for you. Pray that for me. Let's pray that for our saint, our brethren everywhere. That the God, that Lord would count you worthy of this call and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that you might glorify Christ and be kept and Christ may glorify you in himself and it all be according to the grace of our God and our Savior. Amen. All right, Brother Greg.